This is episode 18 of Ethics and Culture Cast from the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. Welcome to episode 18 of Ethics and Culture Cast from the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture. I'm Ken Hellenius, the Communications Specialist at the Center. In this episode, we sit down with Holy Cross Father William R. Daly. Father Bill is our Thomas More Fellow at the CEC and the Director of the Notre Dame Newman Center for Faith and Reason in Dublin, Ireland. We chat about how he got involved with the CEC, about his work in Ireland, and about the educational mission of the Congregation of Holy Cross. Let's pop into the Morris Inn for this week's conversation. Father Bill Daly, thank you very much for sitting down with us today for the podcast. My pleasure, Ken. So, Father Bill, how did you originally get involved with the Center for Ethics and Culture? It's a great question. I don't know that I remember back that far in the mists of time. Uh, The founder of the Center... Uh, Professor David Solomon uh, and I go way back. He was a professor of mine when I was an undergraduate, and he's been um, a friend and supporter of my vocation um, since I was in the seminary. So I can recall in the seminary when he was formulating the ideas for what would become the center, I had him actually come over and uh, speak to a group of seminarians. I had begun a little informal lecture series after our Thursday dinners in the house back at Moreau Seminary. And one of our early speakers was David Solomon. I remember him coming over, talking to the seminarians about, among other things, the tragedy that his view, David, as you know, uh, isn't Catholic, but his sensibility very much is. And he said to these seminarians that, in his view, the greatest living philosopher at the time was Pope John Paul II. And that among other motives that he had in um, developing uh, the Center for Ethics and Culture, it was to promote Um, the philosophy of now St. John Paul II um, and uh, his vision, right, around the gospel of life and so forth. So I've been around the center and its founder since its founding, and um, I don't recall having a level of formal participation until Carter Sneed took over. Uh, We were then colleagues in the Notre Dame Law School, as you know, and um, I was happy to lend a hand uh, uh, to Carter, and he asked if I would take on the formal uh, title of being the first Thomas More Fellow for the Center for Ethics and Culture, as well as, of course, the chaplain uh, involved in many of our yes regular. That, well, you know, the, the fellow role in those days involved my as regularly as I could in between uh, balancing my role. Uh, teaching in the law school and being the rector of Stanford Hall, but I tried to attend as many of the weekly staff meetings as I could. I've been around Notre Dame a lot longer than Carter Sneed. And uh, so very often, if he would have an idea, I might know someone that he'd never met who could help us with that idea in a department or um, in in any of the centers and so forth on campus. So in some ways, I brought a little more institutional knowledge uh, back in those days uh, when Carter was a little fresher face around here and had mostly spent his time gaining tenure in the law school um, rather than glad handing everyone around the university as he now so much more needs to do as a center director. So I think I brought a little institutional knowledge, um, hopefully a little bit of theological acumen. And um, I contributed in those ways. And then, of course, as you know, whenever there was a role for a a chaplaincy, that is to say, if we were going to celebrate mass, either with the staff or with perhaps a benefactor, I would hopefully be on hand for that. Prayers before meals, etc. Indeed. As well as, of course, a very well-received Bread of Life dinner uh, presentation in t- early 2016, spring of 2016. And then in the fall of 2016, you took leave of campus and took on a new role. Uh, so what are you doing now? So I'm now the director of the Notre Dame Newman Center for Faith and Reason in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we are housed in, in a church that was built by Blessed John Henry Newman. And of course, as you know, Blessed John Henry Newman's writings lay out a path for faithful Catholics, faithful believers, really, to understand the complementarity of faith and reason, the reasonableness of faith, 
against the kind of secular mode of the age, which often sees these two, erroneously often sees these two in conflict. Uh, the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin, uh, in 2015 contacted Father John Jenkins, the president of Notre Dame, to say, we have this church that's a great um, uh, part of, of the heritage of the Dublin Archdiocese. It's on St. Stephen's Green. It was built and designed down to every detail. He worked, of course, with architects, but um, Cardinal Newman was involved intimately in, in choosing even the decoration, the beautiful and, and ornate decoration of the tabernacle and uh, all the features of the church. Um, and uh, this beautiful church on St. Stephen's Green that's a gem of church architecture in Ireland and that played a historically important role uh, as the first church for what became University College Dublin. University College Dublin was the successor to a failed effort on the part of Cardinal Newman at the invitation of the Archbishops of Ireland to um, the bishops and archbishops of Ireland to found a Catholic university for Ireland. Ireland was still then under the control of the crown. The crown objected to this. The church didn't have its act together in many ways either, I think. And so he left, uh, Cardinal Newman did, left Ireland unhappy and with the project not a complete success. Though UCD was in many ways functionally, I'd say, and we, we might say sociologically, it occupied the space of a Catholic university for Ireland. The buildings next to my church, which remain UCD buildings, though the rest of campus has moved out to a neighborhood called Belfield in Dublin. Uh, but the buildings next to us are called Newman House, um, and uh, they preserve there, or at least they've restored a room, which would be where the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins died room where he wrote his terrible sonnets in the later phase of his life. And uh, those are the so-called terrible sonnets right. because of their subject matter. They're quite wonderful works of art. Um, and and the Jesuits, I believe, were next in line to take over and run this university project after Cardinal Newman. Once it became officially a state school, they moved out of those premises up the street to Leeson Street, where I now live in what is, has been a continuous community for these 100-plus years of the Jesuits being involved. So that's to say um, Trinity College Dublin was traditionally the Protestant school. It was a crown-founded school, and a number of Dublin's archbishops formally forbade Catholics to attend, not successfully, mm -hmm. and often they would grant exemptions uh, and waivers to this policy. But generally speaking, you'd have thought of UCD as the school where Catholics were and TCD as the school that was meant uh, to serve Ireland's um, Church of Ireland population. So um, the, the move to Belfield meant that our church – uh, no longer had a formal tie to UCD, so there aren't going to be diploma ceremonies there or university lectures. It's known to everyone, not by its formal church name, which is Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, but as University Church Dublin. If you want to find us on Google Maps, you look up Newman University Church, and that's the way you find us. Um, so the archbishop called John Jenkins and said, here's this church. Because of the way its history has developed, it's not now serving its original function, where Newman wanted it to be a vibrant part of the life of the university, a place not just for liturgies, but also for lectures and events. So he thought Notre Dame might bring its resources to bear in a city where educated people have really turned away from the faith in, in large numbers. Uh, church participation, especially among the college-educated professional set in Dublin, would be quite low. And it was the archbishop's hope that Notre Dame might be able to bring liturgies and preaching and uh, other kinds of events. So we do book launches and lectures and concerts of music, sacred and classical, to um, to make this church a vibrant place once again and, and make the faith, I, I would say, uh, plausible to um, the modern educated person who has come to think of it as less than so. And you just had your formal launch, just to just. Well, yes, we've been over there for just over a year. Uh, when we had our formal launch in November, uh, we wanted to come in quietly and not pretend that we had all the answers about how to deal with the the massive and complicated phenomenon of secularization, which has taken root, as you know well, Ken, throughout Europe, um, Ireland for its precipitous crash in in. Uh, external observance of the faith remains actually one of the more religious countries, even so, in Ireland. By most measures, it would be uh, tied with Portugal um, and behind Poland in terms of numbers of people who still call themselves Catholic, which would be very high numbers in, in Ireland uh, on the national census and in a European cultural poll uh, that was of recent vintage, still north of 85% is my recollection of wow. the figures there. So people still consider themselves Catholic, 
um, they, uh, when I talk to people who are not participating in church and who aren't necessarily interested in coming back, though we've become friendly for one reason or another, they do mostly say that they believe in God, they believe in an afterlife. So I, I don't think the church's future in Ireland needs to be bleak. There is still a rooting of faith, a rootedness there. Um, that's where we are in terms of the cultural situation and what we're trying to do. So we wanted to have this quiet entry into Dublin and learn uh, from the people, walk with the people, get a sense. We've put together a board of um, Irish citizens who are our advisory board, and we've met with them to bounce ideas off of them and think about what kinds of programming might work. And meanwhile, Steve Warner, who came over with me from Notre Dame, the founder of the Notre Dame Folk Choir, which he led and directed very successfully for 35 years, Steve worked diligently to find um, young singers and to create a new choir for a new mass that we began at the church, a Sunday evening mass that we're building uh, and hoping to attract a younger uh, mass-going crowd to it. And I'm pleased to say that while the numbers for the mass have been variable and, and generally lower than we would prefer, the age cohort has been, I would say, 20-somethings. So that um, we're just hoping that by word of mouth, um, you know, one person comes, they invite another. And uh, we're in the city center where not many people live. Um, and so anyone who comes to us either in our morning mass or our evening mass feels some tie to the church or now to the Notre Dame Newman Center's mission. Uh, it's not because we're just up the street from them. So... Our our attendance uh, can be harder to build there because people have to elect to come. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the kind of people who have noticed that we exist are already going to church somewhere typically. And and we don't really want to say that our task is mostly to poach. Um, but some people will, I hope, be fed by what we do, especially perhaps a cohort of younger folks who maybe in their parishes don't have a cohort of younger folks. So there may be five twenty somethings going to lots of Dublin parishes, but if if – if they all come to mine on a Sunday, then they'll meet each other and suddenly you have 40 and you have coffee and tea after mass and maybe a, a discussion of theology, like theology on tap sort of thing we're looking at doing in Eastertide. Um, we're hopeful that we can build a community there that will um, uh, be vibrant and, and nourishing for folks. Now, what's the longer term vision for the Notre Dame and Newman Center? Just to keep building. I mean, the the commitment on the part of Father Jenkins and the university to the archbishop was that we'll try this as a pilot for three years. And so we're throwing everything we can at it. We're having, uh, I met this afternoon with a wonderful ethicist in the business school here at Notre Dame. Uh, we're going to try to do a series, he and I, of events uh, on the theme of business ethics, hoping that that will bring a business crowd into the church. Um, where We've had a concert, uh, the debut of an Irish composer's newly composed Latin mass. Uh, that was when Father Jenkins came over at Thanksgiving for our launch week. We've had, as I've said, book launches, and uh, we're having a performance of Haydn's Seven Last Words of Christ uh, for Lent on a Friday, March 2nd. So all kinds of events and programming will continue to do that. We're also working a bit on the physical space. I'd like to have our atrium, which is currently a little bit bland, have a bit more of a tribute to educate people about who Cardinal Newman was and why this church is here and maybe why our center is here, though we don't want them to have to spend all afternoon reading in the <laughs> atrium of the church. So we've got things like that going on. Um, UCD next door to us has been very collaborative with us to the extent possible, given our different missions. And they're opening um, what they're calling the Ulysses Center, which will be a literary exhibition center slash museum featuring Irish writers from Joyce Forward, and uh, that's going to bring a much greater footfall to our otherwise quiet south side of St. Stephen's Green, beginning around this time in 2019, if their construction all continues apace. And so we're very optimistic that um, uh, you know, if we've got some good programming in place, if we've um, made uh, even more vibrant and um, informative our physical space, uh, we're we're trying to expand and get some service uh, to the homeless. We're working with some others um, in Dublin to work on some evenings where people will come to the church, pray for a bit, cook together, take that food out to the homeless, then come back and pray some more, uh, and maybe exchange with each other. You know their thoughts on on um, how this experience is or isn't uh, changing them. It is part of their faith life. So those are kinds of the kinds of initiatives we'll keep doing for the future. Yeah. What do you perceive as the the main challenges to uh to the faith in ireland 
Well, inertia is a challenge for any of us in life, and, and inertia may have kept the faith going in a kind of superficial way in Ireland, as it can in other places. I'm not trying to single Ireland out for criticism, though the inertia of Irish Catholicism is that it was everyone was Catholic. And it, when you're in a place where everyone is Catholic, you don't have to think about what it means to be Catholic. And then when something comes to challenge the faith or topple it over, and uh, that would in this case be the wave of European secularization – as as well then as on top of that and a little bit later, but intensifying it to be sure, the church's own scandals. Mm -hmm. So people are angry at the church, um, and they have right to be angry at the church, and the church has to be slow and humble in rebuilding its credibility as um, a reflection of God's glory, however stained from time to time by our own human sinfulness. And what we've got to do is, is, as the Church ever does, refocus on Christ. It's one thing to be angry at a priest or a bishop. It doesn't follow from that that it's easy to reject the teaching of Jesus uh, and not to consider um, this man who hung on the cross and whose love showed there uh, such that a pagan centurion said, surely this one is the Son of God. So you had a really good thing going here in the law school and with the Center for Ethics and Culture, and then this opportunity comes. And as the rector of Stanford Hall. And, of course, as the rector of Stanford Hall. This opportunity comes, this invitation comes to the university. Um, why did you respond to this, uh, to this call? Well, as a general matter, I think it's a good policy for anyone in life, but in particular an obligatory policy for a priest to say yes when asked to do something unless you have a grave reason to say no. Um, and, uh, I, that, that rule has served me well, um, to, to take it back one step before I talk about the invitation from Father John to go to Ireland. I was teaching in the law school. I had decided not to pursue tenure. I was in talks with the provost and with Carter about various positions we might create, um, that could make use of the combination of my being a lawyer and a priest, um, and that could keep me a little bit in the classroom, but maybe, um, uh, explore building, uh, some program or, or programs and so forth. When I saw um, coming over the electric mail transom uh, news that uh, the rector of what had been my undergraduate residence hall, Stanford Hall, had resigned. And this was approaching Christmas time. I was grading exams and I thought, you know, I never wanted to be a rector. I never cared much about vomit, uh, plumbing uh, or student <laughs> discipline. But something in my head said, I wonder if I should tell them if they're in a jam, I could do that. And then I thought, no, that would be crazy because I'm not at all interested in that work. Uh, I never really got in trouble as an undergraduate. I didn't have to deal much with the hall staff. And so I just didn't think much about the work, quite frankly. And um, I just filed it away and continued um, grading. I remember just in the week before Christmas, so it would have been about December 18th, I was walking into Corby Hall for lunch and I got a phone call from Heather Ricosi Russell. Uh, a wonderful colleague here who hires rectors. And uh, I wasn't even when I, I had her number in my phone, we had served on a committee together. She said, Father Bill, it's Heather. How are you? Please don't hang up on me, but I have something crazy to ask you. And then I had a sense of where she was headed. <clears throat> I said, well, Heather, a priest should not say uh, no, unless he has a grave reason. So please give me 48 hours to concoct a grave reason. <laughs> I will probably fail. And then you can hand over the keys, which is more or less how things unfolded. I told her when I took the keys in January that um, I would only do this job for one semester. She should start hiring my replacement immediately. And she said, well, OK, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And after two weeks of working with the eight senior RAs in particular, but really all of the residents of the hall, I realized it was the best thing I'd gotten to do as a priest. Um, it still is right up there, along with my assignment in Dublin. Um, it's life-giving work. I'm back here on campus for the week, and I've been with my former residents and hall staffers for some wonderful reunions. And um, and my successor uh, is continuing some of the vision and the projects that I had, while, of course, bringing his own unique gifts to the job, and we get along very well. So that was a lesson for me about how God leads us. And it, it turns out that two and a half years into that job, around Christmas time. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, Notre Dame has a lot of international operations. I loved being in a study abroad program. I like to travel now. You and I have had the chance to travel. We've been blessed with the Center of Ethics and Culture, which does some international programming. And Not to mention the personal driving across the country together. It, that that it's too, fun. yes. And so I said to myself, maybe I should tell Father Jenkins that I might be interested in doing something international. But again, I filed it away and didn't act on it. Two weeks later, in the midst of the Corby Hall annual retreat that happens over Christmas break, uh, we have a preached retreat in the house. Um, there was a meeting 
about our Kyle Moore Abbey project in the west of Ireland and Father Tim Scully, who um, uh, kind of has spearheaded that project because he's very close to the to the benefactors and has always been close to Notre Dame's international operations and especially those in Ireland. He gathered a group of priests to, to see if we'd like to uh, throw our hats in the ring to head over for various events at Kyle Moore throughout the year so that they would have chaplaincy from Holy Cross priests. And um, at the end of that, he asked me to stick around and said, you know, John's going to be asking you to take on this project at Newman University Church, so uh, look for that call. Mm -hmm. And two days later, I was in Father Jenkins' office, and um, six months later, I was in Dublin. So the answer to the question is, I believe the Holy Spirit was at work, uh, and there there were these intimations in my own personal reflection and prayer that then flowered forth in invitations from the university, first in the case to be the rector of Stanford Hall, of all things, and then uh, the invitation to come over and start this center um, in John Henry Newman's church. Can you talk a bit from the perspective of a member of the Congregation of Holy Cross about the relationship and the, the ministry of education that is that comes from your founder? We say in our constitutions that we're to be educators in the faith, and we've always interpreted that broadly. So um, in its current manifestation, though we do parish ministry, we favor parishes that have schools um, in terms of where we're going to deploy our resources, our human resources, as it were. And um, beyond that, you know, Holy Cross educators have a model uh, at Notre Dame that I would say we try to replicate elsewhere, which is very much one of companionship. You know, most of us live in dorms with the students and um, where we dine with them in the dining halls. We get to know them in a personal way and they get to know us so that if we're teaching political science like Tim or legal ethics, as in my case, even if these are not explicitly religious topics, people can see that our dedication to doing the job well um, flows from our priestly vocation and that uh, our sense, our Catholic sense of the vision of the human person certainly doesn't see as in any way in competition the, the more, quote, secular um, subjects of university study and uh, our own and overall Catholic mission to which we're devoted. And I would say that um, that residential model, um, that heavy importance of the residential component, the life in the dorms, where uh, we try to have community built around uh, being a community of worship, communities of service. As you've probably learned in your years here, Ken, uh, our students are extremely generous, and a lot of that is based within dorms. Dorms will have a service commissioner. They'll have a liturgical commissioner. These are jobs that people uh, probably don't run for in, in uh, at Ohio State, certainly not the liturgical mm-hmm. side. I'm sure there's a lot of volunteerism at, at uh, non-Catholic schools. I don't mean to denigrate their missions, but ours does flow out of these deeper commitments and and, um, and it's a part of our integrity as a Catholic institution that we foster those. So I think those are hallmarks of what we do. But, you know, uh, Jesuits have run great schools and continue to do so, and Franciscans and so forth. And we're all trying to serve the same God and spread the same gospel. So I don't ever think one should overemphasize just what's so distinctive about um, a uh, Holy Cross education. It ought to look like an education um, that comes, you know, from people inspired by Jesus the Christ, um, more so than by Basil Moreau uh, or uh, in in fealty to our French foundings. I don't speak the French. Um, uh, I like French food. I've enjoyed my, being able to visit Le Mans on a university pilgrimage with staff. But we're also very much now an American congregation. Uh, Father Soren was, was one who embraced America in many ways. And so we're, we're always a work in progress. Well, Father Bill Daly, Thomas More Fellow of the Center for Ethics and Culture and Director of the Notre Dame Newman Center for Faith and Reason, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kenneth John Hellenius. Thank you to Father Bill for a delightful conversation. You can learn more about the Notre Dame Newman Center for Faith and Reason in the show notes. Subscribe to Ethics and Culture Cast, which is released every other Thursday during the academic year, by visiting ethicscenter.nd.edu slash podcast. We would love your feedback. Please give us a review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, and email your suggestions to cecpodcast at nd.edu. Our theme music is I Don't Know by Grapes. 
licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution License. We'll see you next time on Ethics and Culture Cast. Until then, make good decisions.